This is a story about betrayal, dazzling success, and the search for truth in a world where no one is who they seem to be. I'll be sharing a shocking and unsettling chapter of my life. Two of my closest friends crossed unimaginable boundaries with my wife while I was at work, and what's even more bewildering is her unexpected reaction to the situation. Join me as I navigate through the complexities of this harrowing experience and explore the impact it had on our lives. I'm Todd, a quite attractive and intelligent guy, or at least I consider myself so, and I have a healthy self-esteem. I am a fairly successful programmer in one of the commercial companies. The amazing thing is that I can work only 50 minutes a week and still earn a substantial amount of money for it. However, it doesn't mean I'm idle the rest of the time. I constantly develop and learn something new every day. I was the guy who made it. I've read many motivational books, watched interviews with wealthy people, and ultimately pulled myself out of poverty. Therefore, I cherish everything I have, and every day I am grateful for what I possess. But perhaps my greatest achievement in life is my wife, Judith, who is four years younger than me. She's a photographer who has participated in various advertising campaigns with a significant following on social media, and she generally enjoys her life. Judith has a slender, sun-kissed body, well-toned thighs, and a very nice bust, but she wasn't always like that. Her life changed dramatically after meeting me. When we first met, she was an ordinary cashier in a store with no ambitions or goals. Still, I noticed that spark in her and helped ignite it. Even then, I held a good position, and though I didn't earn as much money as I do now, I could afford a lot. For me, Judith quit her job as a cashier, and I found her an excellent producer who helped her succeed on social media. Now, our combined incomes allow us to live a luxurious life. This might sound like some success story and other nonsense, and honestly, I thought so too until life smacked me in the face with reality. I have friends from school, Philip and Alan, who were with me up to a certain point. At 18, we started our first business, an ice cream stand, but unfortunately, it quickly went down the drain. Six months later, we launched another business selling hot dogs, but after five months, we had to close it. After that, there were more attempts, but all of them were futile. At 21, I realized that something needed to change, so I entered the AT field, which was new for me, but I knew it held a future. My friends didn't support my idea, saying it's a waste of time. You need to deal with real things, create something of your own, not work for someone else, they said. I disagreed with them because I thought ahead. I understood that becoming a skilled specialist would enable me to start my own project in the future, and it turned out that way. Philip and Alan continued to try building a business. Now they have only one fast food stand that has been holding on for five years, and their profit is split in half. However, compared to the money I'm making, their profit is peanuts. Instead of exploring something new and moving forward, they, like stubborn sheep, continued to hammer in one spot. They succeeded, but I don't think it's the result they were hoping for. While I could afford to travel to different countries, buy expensive clothes and cars, dine in restaurants, and have a wife with model looks, these two continue to live in the city, facing stress from their daily affairs. I'm not angry with them for not wanting to join me. It was their choice, and I understand them. Now we maintain a connection, but it's not like it used to be. They can come to my place on weekends, sit on my leather couch, and we can play video games and discuss mundane things together. Despite our differences, we maintained a good relationship and often met, mostly at my place. They liked my affluent home, but I didn't immediately realize that my wife was also appealing to them. For me, meetings with Philip and Alan were like a distraction. They were simple guys without education, and I liked that. I could sit with them, have a beer, and talk about all sorts of nonsense. I didn't try to boast in front of them on the contrary. I tried to lower myself to their level and be down to earth. Judith was never against me spending a couple of evenings a week with friends. She had her own girlfriends, and she often hung out with them. Judith and I were very hospitable, so our home was never empty. One evening when I was returning home, I was stopped by a neighbor named Jimmy. He was a director. He stopped me and asked, Todd, how are you? I don't want to seem intrusive and most importantly, don't think I'm spying on you, but I noticed something strange. When you're not home, a Ford often parks near your house. I even took a picture of it. 
I took his phone and started looking at the photo. The photo showed a white Ford, my friend Philip's car. Thank you, Mr. Jefferson, for your attention. I'll try to figure out what's going on. You're welcome. Oh, wait, may I ask you for a favor? Could you, when you're home during the day, keep an eye on my house? And if you see the car, let me know. No problem. Good night. Thank you very much. Good night. This was clearly a red flag and couldn't be ignored. Why is my friend coming to my wife while I'm at work? With this question in mind, I entered the house where Judith greeted me. She came out in a white robe and without saying a word began, Darling, I'm so glad you're home. I have a surprise for you. You need to pull the string. I pulled the string and before me unfolded a work of art. Judith bought a new sexy nurse costume. I think you're a bit tired, but I know how to fix it. First, you need to take a shower, and then I'll be waiting for you in my medical office. I quickly took a shower, and Judith and I spent an unforgettable night. Such spontaneity made all my thoughts fly away, and I completely surrendered to the moment. The next day, I didn't have to go anywhere, which meant that Judith and I would spend the whole day together. I thought that perhaps yesterday Philip dropped by to pick up something he forgot and just stopped by quickly. At least that's what I wanted to believe. I didn't want to entertain the thought that Judith could cheat on me, especially with my friend. Judith and I had quite an ordinary day, and in the evening, we planned to relax by watching a movie. However, our plans were interrupted by Alan, who wanted to invite us somewhere. Buddy, let's go to the club tonight. It'll be fun. You can bring Judith along. I declined, not only because Judith and I had plans for the evening, but also because I didn't enjoy going to clubs, especially with Judith, who would find it boring. Since Philip and Alan didn't have girlfriends, friends Philip tried to build relationships and even got married, but in the end, he cheated on his wife and she left him. Alan just had bad luck with girlfriends, and his longest relationship lasted only a year. I always told them that if they wanted to go out together, they needed to find girlfriends. They would just nod silently and say they'd find someone soon. I told Judith about Alan's proposal and noticed her disappointment. Apparently, she wanted to go out and have some fun, but I didn't pay much attention to it. The next day, I had to go to work. I kissed Judith and left. At noon, my neighbor Jimmy called and reported, Todd, a car has parked near your house again. I don't know exactly when, but I'm calling to let you know. Thanks, Jimmy. How long will you be home? All day. Hmm. All right. If it's not too much trouble, could you call me when you see that the car has left? Sure, I'll keep you posted. We said goodbye, and my mind was once again flooded with doubts. Five hours had passed since Jimmy's call, and during this time, I was in a state of uncertainty. Suddenly, the phone rang. Todd, the car is leaving. Two men got in. I thanked Jimmy and hung up. Now there were no doubts. My two friends were coming to my wife when I wasn't home. But if I initially thought it was only Philip, now I realized that Alan was involved too. At first, I tried to reassure myself with the thought that maybe they were preparing a surprise for my birthday. However, my birthday was still four months away. Wasn't it too early? To avoid unnecessary panic, I decided to call an acquaintance and ask for a couple of video cameras and a listening device. After work, I picked up the equipment. He asked why I needed it, and I made up an excuse saying it wasn't for me. As I drove home, my hands were trembling. I even felt ashamed that I would be spying on my wife because I was so certain that she couldn't betray me. Entering the house, Judith greeted me joyfully. We had a delicious meal and went to bed where we engaged in sex again. During this time, I didn't notice anything unusual about her. Usually when a woman cheats on a man, she changes in behavior and character, but my wife was as usual, even better. The next morning, Judith was getting ready for a promotional video shoot, and I went with her. On the back seat of my car, there was a bag with the forgotten video cameras. During the trip, Judith asked about them. What's that you got there, kiddo? It's some stuff from work. I needed to throw it away. I'll do it later when I leave. With this statement, I killed two birds with one stone. During the time Judith was working, I went home. Time flew by and I didn't realize that two hours had passed. However, all the cameras were set up one in the bedroom. 
another in the living room, the third in the kitchen, and the fourth outside. I completely forgot that I was supposed to pick up Judith. As I stepped out of the house, I noticed a white Ford pulling up and Judith and Philip got out. I called you 20 times. Where were you disappearing to, Todd Judith said, and I checked my phone. Indeed, there were 20 missed calls from her. I apologize, but Judith just walked past me silently. At that moment, Philip approached. Dude, you messed up big time and I had to handle things myself. Sorry, just got caught up. It was an urgent call and I needed to fix a project. All right, no big deal. I can help you out considering how many times you've bailed me out. We said our goodbyes and I went back into the house. The whole evening passed in a silent atmosphere. Judith was upset with me for not picking her up, so I tried to apologize. You promised to pick me up. Why didn't you come? There was an urgent order. Forgive me. I won't forgive it next time we hugged each other and went to bed. I felt ashamed that I could suspect her of something. I didn't fully believe it, thinking that Jimmy, the old man, let his imagination run wild. However, since he provided me with photos, I had to personally confirm everything. At night, while Judith slept, I decided to unlock her phone and check her messages. I found nothing suspicious in them. The phone was clean. I went to sleep with a clear conscience. Two weeks passed since I installed cameras in my house. All the time at work, I kept an eye on what Judith was doing at home, and everything seemed fine. Nothing suspicious, not a hint of anything. After that night, I decided to check Judith's phone a couple more times, and it turned out to be clean. No signs of infidelity or communication with my friends. Everything was normal. We hung out with Philip and Alan, spending quality time together. Judith worked and we went out to the city, visited various interesting places, and overall lived a peaceful life. One day at work, I decided to check the cameras. I was already tired of doing this every time. I understood that I wouldn't find anything and it seemed pointless. Other thoughts started bothering me. What if Judith finds the camera and thinks I'm spying on her and don't trust her? I looked at the camera and saw Judith opening the door, unexpected for me. I turned on the outdoor camera and saw a white Ford parked near my house. Philip and Alan were standing on the porch. Judith had happily greeted my friends and they entered. I unplugged the listening device, which was installed in the living room under the coffee table. Judith went upstairs to the bedroom while Philip and Alan took off their shirts and sat on the couch with bare torsos. And Judith changed in the room and I saw her taking out a sexy costume from the wardrobe, the same one she wore for me the night before. I watched everything without taking my eyes off, but at that moment I decided what I would do with them. If it was time to take out the trash, quite literally, I called a person with an untraceable number whose name couldn't be disclosed, but let's call him Mr. Keller. He specialized in discreetly disposing of trash on request. I, I called Mr. Keller and outlined the entire situation, my voice trembling and the phone almost slipping from my hands. All right, we'll be waiting for you at the payment spot, and the moment you pay, the car will head to your house and collect the garbage. The conversation was brief, and the cost for such a service was not small. I needed to move quickly to the payment location. Fortunately, I had enough cash in my car for this service. I decided to check the cameras and saw my wife already on her knees, pleasing my friends. I felt like I was going to be sick because if I hadn't found out, I would have come home in the evening and kissed her. I drove like a maniac, as if I were not myself. I was shaking all over and it felt like I could faint. I felt so bad, so hurt, and I even shed a tear. I couldn't understand how my school friends and my wife could betray me like this. I quickly arrived at the location, an abandoned building. I needed to leave an envelope, so I placed the envelope with money under a stone and sent a message eggs laid. Literally within the next minute, I received a message my chicks flew out of the nest. I rushed back home, leaving the car nearby and started observing from a distance. I checked my phone and at that moment Jimmy called, saying there was a white Ford near my house. I told him everything was fine. I turned on the cameras again and saw two men enjoying my wife on my leather couch. It felt like I was watching an adult movie. It hurt again, but I sensed that justice would prevail soon. 
10 minutes after I arrived home, a white van pulled up. Three sturdy men dressed in all black and wearing balaclavas immediately stormed into my house. One thug knocked out Philip with a single blow, the second subdued Alan, and the third silenced Judith. They were knocked to the floor, tied up, had bags put over their heads, and quickly carried away in the van, which sped off. I witnessed it all through the cameras and marveled at their professionalism. They completed the job in about 40 seconds. All that was left for me was to wait a couple of days for the results. I decided to check with my neighbor to see if he saw anything, and luckily he saw nothing. I returned to work, and on my way back home in the evening I called the police reporting that my wife was missing. Before that, I had broken and discarded the phones of Judith and my friends, making them untraceable. The next day, a tow truck removed the white Ford from my house. I informed the police that, as usual, I returned home but found my wife missing without any clues. All neighbors in the area provided their statements, confirming that the white Ford frequently approached my house when I wasn't home. I was surprised to learn that not only Jimmy had seen this car near my house. Since the car was registered under Philip's name, he became the primary suspect. Initially, they also suspected me, but when they called my workplace, they found out I hadn't left on the day of the disappearance. While the investigation was ongoing, I backed up all the camera recordings onto a disc and hit it well. Four days later, I received an anonymous video showing three bodies being delivered to the destination point. The video depicted them being taken out of a van with their eyes, hands, and feet tied in an empty field. All three were crying and pleading for mercy, and I found it amusing to watch. Since my main condition was that no one should die, they were left in the desert with their hands untied and instructed not to move for an hour. After that, the vehicle left, and what happened to them next was entirely up to them. They were transported in a van from Nevada to Texas, and at that point I no longer cared whether anyone would return alive or not. A month later, the case reached a deadlock, and the detective suggested that my wife probably ran away with Philip, having some kind of affair. I accepted his version. No one was looking for Alan because he had no parents or even a girlfriend, and their joint business had collapsed as no one managed it for a month. I didn't attempt a divorce, as it would raise suspicions. Instead, I hired a lawyer and we started the process. If Judith didn't return home within a couple of months, we could file for divorce due to her disappearance. A month later, I was called in for questioning at the police station for identification. They showed me two men and one woman, all from a photograph. I didn't immediately recognize my wife and two friends in them. They looked like they aged years more than they actually were, and I found it amusing. They were all in worn out, torn clothes, emaciated, and overall looked terrible. I identified all three and asked the investigator how they were found and where they were. He said that in Texas, a couple of naked savages robbed a gas station, stole someone else's car, and drove off in an unknown direction. Exactly 24 hours later, the car was found by the roadside. The thing is, they stole a car that wasn't fueled, and they couldn't drive for long. Eventually, they were arrested and are currently serving their sentences in prison. I sighed and thought to myself, at least they're alive, I didn't expect this outcome. I thought they'd have enough sense to make it home intact and unharmed. Instead, out of desperation, they chose to commit a crime. I was horrified to realize that these people had accompanied me for a significant part of my life, and I didn't feel sorry for them. Seriously, who could pity them? I managed to get a divorce. I can't say it was easy, but I succeeded and I officially became a free man. I traveled to Texas once to look each of them who betrayed me straight in the eyes. All three seemed completely out of it, but the most amusing part was that none of them even suspected it was my doing. None of them considered it could be revenge for their betrayal, and it even saddened me a bit that they didn't realize the gravity of their sin against me. I was glad to stay on the sidelines, but when I looked at these people, they were utterly unfamiliar to me. They were lost individuals. When I directly asked Judith if she had betrayed me, she quietly said, never. I smiled and walked away. I honestly expected a struggle. I thought they'd return home and realize I was the one who sent them to the desert. However, they turned out to be so weak and foolish that they dug themselves into an even deeper hole. 
I only gave them an opportunity to show themselves how they would act under stressful conditions, but they turned out to be cowardly and chose to commit a crime instead. I don't know how I would have acted in their situation, but I'll say this, I wouldn't have found myself in such a situation. I value the people around me, respect them, and always speak the truth, but if someone crosses me, I won't stay silent. I'll take action. I moved to Florida and plan to live here for at least a year. If I find a girlfriend, that's good. If not, that's also good. I've become more laid back about life. I have enough money to live comfortably until old age and not deny myself anything. I'm intelligent and cautious. I continue to evolve, and I want everyone who hears my story to evolve, regardless of circumstances, to make the right choices for themselves. If life throws garbage at you, grab a rake and clean up. Garbage belongs in the trash, not in your life. Thank you for listening to my story. That's the end of it. This story about betrayal, determination, and taking responsibility for one's life leaves deep reflections. It reminds us that in a world where trust can be broken, it is important to remain strong and strive for justice. Story 2, my dad cheated on my mom after 30 years of marriage. I desperately need help ASAP. For context, in 2022, my mother got married to the love of her life quite young and had to face a lot of issues on the in-laws side and also to get approval of my dad from her parents. Back then, she fought with everyone and told him just to never break her trust. It was a love marriage and growing up, my elder sibling and I always saw our parents' marriage as perfect. They were so in love and always showed affection. There were minute fights, but they always solved them. We look forward to having someone meet the standards of our dad to be our future partner. My mother is a stay-at-home mom and made sure we were given the right values and utmost love. She faced a lot of discrimination from in-laws for the same. My mother was diagnosed with chronic depression. She has migraines and cervical pain. Both her health has been deteriorating over the past 15 years and just recently got better. She also has anger issues and sometimes doesn't know how to not control everything. She recently lost both her parents and is finally dependent on my father. My father has a job that requires constant travel, and he has been the most loving man to all of us and provided with everything he could and more. He's never raised his hand on anyone. For the longest, he was the sole breadwinner. He has taken utmost care of my mother, even when she would sometimes not be rational and say no one loves her, everything is her fault, or feel guilty after lashing out on me or my sister. Coming back to the current scenario my mother found on Facebook messages and is completely broken, constantly crying and saying she can't believe it. She feels betrayed because she blindly trusted him and never once went through his phone or social media. She has fallen sick and is talking about dying or going to her father's mountain and constantly looking into the abyss. He, in the moment, also said to her that everyone does this and it's not that big of a deal and she's overreacting because she shouted and broke his phone. My sister and I both live in other states and were called back to our hometown to talk about this as a family. I do not know what to say or do because my whole image of him has been shattered and it's disgusting for him to say it's not that big of a deal. On the other hand, I'm extremely scared of my mother taking any step to end everything. I don't know what would help. Please advise. Family crisis is always difficult, but it's important to offer support and compassion to each other. Seek professional help if necessary and pay attention to your own emotional well-being. Maintain open communication with your family and strive to overcome difficulties together. Story 3, I, a 25M, found out my girlfriend, also 25, has been cheating on me with a college professor. I'm honestly still shocked and hurt by the news. She completely broke my trust, and I don't know how I'm supposed to move on. She and I were high school sweethearts. I've known her my entire life. We even used to have playdates together as children. When we got into high school, we started dating in our sophomore year and we had been together ever since. Everybody thought that we were going to be together forever. We were even voted as the best couple every year during high school. She got into an Ivy League college in her state but my grades have never been close to hers. While she was in college, I took a job at a real estate firm, planning on getting my license when I knew the industry a little bit better. We would always visit each other on the weekends because we weren't too far away, but I had some concerns while she was in college. I never thought that she was cheating on me, but I felt insecure about the possibility of it. Honestly, both of us came from nothing, 
and I was worried she would realize she could do better with her life and leave me. I thought that when she got into this fancy Ivy League school, some rich lacrosse player was going to sweep her off her feet and she would forget all about me. She would reassure me whenever she could tell that I was feeling bad, so I stopped worrying. When she graduated with her undergraduate degree, the school offered her a faculty position that allowed her to pursue her graduate degree at no cost. It was too good of an opportunity to pass up, even though it meant that we would be apart longer. Her job was to assist one of the professors in her department with his research. He was a prominent researcher in their field, and he had a team of students working under him, doing all of the actual work that he was taking credit for. Because of her new job, we couldn't even see each other on the weekends. Every now and then, I would come up and surprise her, but she was always so stressed and tired from her work that we never had any fun. However, when I did get the chance to talk to her, all she would talk about was her professor. She idolized him like he was the lead singer of some rock band. At first, I thought it was just professional admiration, but when I saw a picture of both of them in one of the school's newsletters, I started to raise my eyebrows. It was a harmless article highlighting the research that the chemistry department had been doing. Inside the article, there were different pictures of the students doing the research as well as some candid shots of everybody while they were working. I happened to notice that in one of the pictures his hand was resting on my girlfriend's lower back. For some people that's a harmless gesture, but seeing her much older male professor doing that to her brought up a lot of red flags for me. Shortly after seeing the image, I gave her a call and asked her about it straight up. She laughed at me and told me that I had nothing to worry about and that I was just in my own head and feeling insecure like I always was. She and I rarely fought, but the way she phrased her statements made me pretty angry, and we got into a huge argument about it. After two days of not talking, I caved in and called her and apologized, and it seemed like everything was going to be good from there. Our anniversary was coming up, and we had originally planned for her to take the entire weekend off so we could spend it together. I was halfway to her apartment when she called me and told me she wasn't able to step away from the lab. I pulled over on the side of the road and talked to her about it, telling her how disappointed I was that she wasn't putting her foot down about it since this meant so much to us. She promised me that she would make it up to me the following weekend and told me just to turn around and go home. I was closer to her apartment than I was to my house, so I just carried on moving forward. I figured that if she was stressed out and tired, I could at least order some takeout for her and spend a few hours with her before leaving. When I got to her apartment, I unlocked the door with the spare key that I had and right away I realized that she was home. She had told me on the phone that she would be at the lab for most of the night, so that was a surprise. I could smell food and I could hear giggling coming from her bedroom. I walked further in and saw that there had been a meal recently cooked. Two plates were on the table and a half-empty bottle of wine accompanied them. My heart completely sank into my stomach, just as I had suspected there was definitely something going on. I didn't know who it was, but she clearly had somebody here for a romantic night, and they were in bed with her. I cautiously approached her door and opened it to find her in bed with her professor on top of her. They didn't notice me right away, but when I spoke up and asked what was going on, he jumped off of her and she quickly ran up to me and tried to calm me down. It was almost comical how hard the professor was trying to hide his face from me. Clearly, he didn't want me to tell anyone about what I saw, so I stormed out of her apartment, dropping my spare key on the ground before I left. I never wanted to go back there again. It was a lot for me to process. For the first few days after it happened, I was practically dead to the world. I had planned on marrying my girlfriend, and before I even had a chance to propose, she threw eight years of a relationship away. We could have had a love story to tell our grandchildren about, but she ruined it. After I got myself together, I realized that I needed to move on by getting a little revenge of my own. Obviously, the professor did not want me to see who he was because he was afraid of losing his job. I knew that once the headlines were out about a notable professor taking advantage of his college students, he would never find another job in the industry again. I called the HR department of the university and told them about what I saw. They told me they would be launching an investigation. I knew it would be my word against his, and I unfortunately didn't get any evidence. As a week passed and nothing happened. I assumed they were sweeping it under the rug, so I called a local newspaper, and they were very interested in the scandal. 
It didn't take long for me to finally see the news that he had been fired. I hadn't spoken to my ex since the night I found her in bed with her professor, but her parents were furious with me about outing the relationship. Apparently, since the professor she was hired to work for no longer worked at the university, she didn't have a job. That meant that they would either have to shell out tens of thousands of dollars for her graduate degree, or she would no longer be enrolled. She ended up having to drop out because they couldn't afford to take out any more loans for her. She is out of my life completely, but I still don't know what I'm supposed to do moving forward. She was the first and only woman I've been with, and I am a little afraid to get back out there. Ultimately, although discovering infidelity can cause a lot of pain and disappointment, it's important not to give in to feelings of revenge. Focus on your own healing, seek support, and remember that with time and self-care you can recover and find happiness in the future.